Hey Flock, Mike here from Epic Duck Studios and welcome to the Epic Hobby. Today I'm going to be painting Spider-Man from Marvel Crisis Protocol. I'll be using Kalidor Sky from Citadel, Mephist in Red, also from Citadel. These will be my base coats for the blue and red parts, obviously. These are the same colors I use for both Captain Marvel and Captain America. And I'm repeating these colors on purpose to help kind of tie my colors together and really kind of get that feel of complementary four color heroes from you know, really old school comics. Now, when red and blue paint overlap each other, they obviously create a bit of a purple. Now, which red and blues you use will define how purple that gets, but basically you get an area that obviously isn't the color you want on either case. So what I'm trying to do here is just be as precise as possible and keep the red to the red parts as opposed to doing a, you know, big sort of broad sloppy base coat with the red and then just doing tightly focused blue. I'm tightly focusing both colors here. So you can see I'm working around the eyes, which I know I'm going to be lining in black and filling with white. And again, neither of those I really want to have to deal with a red paint there. Black really wouldn't be too bad. Black covers red nicely, but white sure doesn't. Now one thing you'll notice, I'm doing almost everything in single coats. Both Mephist in Red and Kalidor Sky are very vibrant colors, and I've got a very light base coat here. And over lighter base coats, they tend to cover really well in one coat. There's a little bit of a misconception that you always need to thin your paints. I'm using a wet palette and I'm using a dampened brush and that already gives me some natural thinning, but most hobby paint actually comes in a fairly thin format. It's not made of thick, chunky particles of pigment. You know, it's a very, very fine grain paint. And if you're applying it with a little bit of skill, you're making sure you smooth it out on the model instead of just slapping it on you really don't have to worry about getting too thin coats all the time. There's a time and a place to thin paint, but it doesn't have to be done 100% of the time. So I'm giving you permission right now, as long as you smooth your paints out on the model, one coat is perfectly okay if you get the coverage you want from it. So the model has a little bit of ribbing between where the red and blue areas are. And so I'm making sure I'm trying to leave that alone because I do want to paint that in black. I'm actually going to use a bit of an off black because that way when I go to line it with my black ink later, there's a little bit of a color variation. I'm also being really careful not to paint over the spider on his back. Originally I thought that was going to be black, but it actually ends up being red. So now I'm going to paint Spider-Man's eye lenses and I'm going to come in first with some Fenrisian gray. I want something a little bit off white so I have room to add a highlight. If I start with pure white, there's just nowhere else to go. So here I'm coming back in with the red just to get that spider emblem on his back, which again, I thought I was going to paint in black and change my mind. Now, because this is an embossed detail as in it's raised off the surface, you want to make sure you get the sort of edges of the embossing. There's a little bit of a, you know, boundary around the whole spider. You want to make sure none of that is left either blue or primer gray. So now I'm bringing out some Reaper Noir Black. Citadel Corvus Black is a very comparable color. They're what I like to think of as old t-shirt black. They, they're the color of a black shirt that has been washed 50 times and is starting to fade just a little bit. And I'm going to be using this to paint all that ribbing between the blue and red areas of the costume, as well as the spider on his chest and the border around Spider-Man's eye lenses. So far, this is the most precise and detailed step of this. The red and blue base coats feel like they just got slapped on compared to doing these little black lines. But this is a really good kind of warm up for doing all the really thin black lining of the webbing aspect of the red part of the suit.
Now when you're working on the black around the eye, don't worry too much if you get a little bit on the inside of the eye. I'm going to go back in myself with a little bit of that Fenrisian gray and just do a small touch up. Mistakes happen and you really shouldn't let them discourage you from doing a really good paint job. Just acknowledge that they're going to happen and fix them when they come up. And so here I'm bringing that Fenrisian gray back in and just making the lens area of the eye just a little bit bigger just because the black did travel just a little bit inside the lens. Now I'm going to throw some paint down on the base as well. This is Mechanicus Standard Gray, which is just one of my favorite grays to work with. It's a nice sort of mid-tone gray. I'm also going to work with a little bit of Administratum Gray for the pile of rubble. And I didn't show it here yet, but I'm going to be using some Mornfang Brown for the steel beam he's standing on as well. Give it a bit of a rusty look. And that's mostly just to help it stand off from the big pile of gray that he's otherwise got going on. Now I'm going to work on a layer of highlights for the costume itself, specifically on the red and blue aspects. And for the red, I'm going to be highlighting with Evil Sun Scarlet from Citadel. You can see that Evil Sun Scarlet is a very vibrant, almost instantaneous highlight here. It's very noticeable over the Mephiston Red, even though Mephiston Red itself is a pretty bright color. Evil Sun Scarlet is just that one shade where if it got any brighter, it would be pink, but it's still very noticeably red, and that works great for highlighting any kind of red costume. Because pink exists, because we see a light red and think of pink, it can actually be very challenging to highlight red clothing or any kind of red surface, because if your highlights are too broad, it starts to look like a pink surface with red shadows instead of, you know, a highlighted red surface. And this is just one of those weird things where language affects how we think about color. Because if we just called pink light red, there would be no sort of mental discrepancy. But because we think of pink as its own sort of unique color, we can't really use it properly as a light red in a lot of cases without giving the meaning of pink to it. It's a really weird little trick. Because with blue, you don't have that problem. Every shade of blue from a deep navy to the lightest baby blue is still blue. With reds, if you need to work in a highlight and you find that it's feeling a little bit too pink, you can either shorten up those highlights a little bit, like for example, this Evil Sun Scarlet is not that vibrant. It doesn't get into being, you know, super whitish tones. You can also highlight it with yellows and oranges, which kind of gives you more of the feel of it being out on a sunny day. Or you can actually use skin tones as well. Caucasian skin tones like Kislev Flesh actually make really good highlights on red as well. Now to highlight the blue parts of the costume, I'm going to be using Citadel Techless Blue. The highlights I'm doing are fairly broad and all focused on the top of the model. I know that with this comic style painting, I'm going to be bringing deep, broad shadows across the bottom of the model, so anything that's kind of a downward facing surface, the underside of the arms, under the armpit, you know, underneath the thighs and so on. And so these are going to be a counterpoint to those sort of underslung shadows. So really, it's all the surfaces kind of facing towards the top of the model, almost things going straight up. Alright, now it's time for my favorite part of comic style painting, and that is the black inking. Today I'm using De La Rowney FW ink. Other inks that work really, really well are Higgins Black Magic. That's actually my preferred ink now. I've filmed this a few months ago, to be honest, and I'm just finally getting around to editing it. And I've since started using Higgins because I find it just a little bit more opaque. But Higgins Black Magic, De La Rowney FW, Liquitex Carbon Black, all really good solid black inks. I also have some students that have used Amsterdam Black Ink and really like it. Inking is a really fun process because ink flows off your brush in a very different way than paint does. It moves very freely and it's very opaque. Most black paints tend to actually be a very, very dark blue or very dark purple. And they also tend to dry on your brush a little bit faster. They don't flow as freely from the brush. And as you use them, you start to wear out or run out of the pigment on the brush. Whereas as you can see with the ink, Every line is as consistently black as the last one. It just keeps on performing 
kind of to the same level the whole time. And that's really, that kind of consistency really helps with this style. Because you don't want some of the line work to be even slightly translucent or not as impactful as the line before it. So this first step in my comic style lining is just to follow along the grooves in the model. And these are really apparent on Spider-Man, especially because we've already basically painted those black and we're just basically hitting either side of those black ribbed details with a black line. I'm also adding outlines to both of the spider emblems, so the one on his chest as well as the one on his back. The brush I'm using for this is a 3-0 from GameEnvy.net from their Artist Arsenal line of brushes. And I actually chose these brushes for Game Envy to carry specifically because I use them in my comic style work. It's a very controlled, precise tip and takes to inking very, very well. You can see the lines I make just have a very nice consistent width to them. The flow off the brush is very smooth and having a really fine pointed brush without a really big reservoir. You don't want that huge body that say like a size two or something bigger might give you because that can get too loaded up with ink. But using a small brush, we control the amount of ink and therefore we kind of control how freely it flows. Now there are cases where you want to have a little bit more flow to your ink. And what I mean by that is where I'm trying to kind of fill in a big deep shadow, especially in a hard to reach place, like the underside of a model. I'll sometimes use a bigger brush and kind of load it up and then just smear the ink in there. With a lot of the Marvel Crisis Protocol minis though, that's really not necessary because they often have these very wide open accessible poses. There is no part of Spider-Man here that is hard to reach with a paintbrush. And that's not always true of all minis, especially if you think of like Warhammer 40k models, there's often parts of the model that are hidden by other parts of the model. You know, a Marine holding the bolter across his chest, you know, maybe a flowing cape in the way, the, you know, there's that area between the backpack and the shoulder pad of Marine you can't reach. And those kind of scenarios are really common, but they just don't really come up with the Marvel Crisis Protocol minis. These are almost universally wide open, easily approached poses. So there's all the basic outlining done. You honestly could stop here and you've got a really striking model, but we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna start building some shadows. I'm starting with the area underneath the legs. This is a spot that directly points to the base. And by filling this with black, what we get is the ability to have an outline in profile. And what I mean by that is when you look at the model kind of straight on, you get a black line underlining the shape of the leg. And it helps sell the illusion that the model has been drawn instead of painted. Now I'm carrying that same technique up onto the arms and just adding a small shadow to the very lowest point of the arm, the part that is really, you know, facing closest to the base. Now this sort of shadow can get a little bit tricky with really fine details like the hand here where there actually are outstretched fingers. So you can see I'm not focusing too much on the hand just a little bit of a shadow. You can see it's kind of got a little bit of a crescent shape to it and a very, very fine line of this just along the bottom of each finger. And I'm also putting a little bit of a shadow underneath his chin and just carrying that into the neck muscle a little bit just to create those shapes, kind of, you know, lend a little bit of weight to the movement of the model when viewed from certain angles. Also filling in a little bit of the bottom of the boot and what that does is help make the model appear distinct from its base, right? The black line around the foot makes it very clear there's a break there and it's a distinct element. Now I'm adding those same sort of filler shadows to the boots on the part facing closest to the base. And this starts to get a little bit tricky because the angle's really weird here, just how he's sort of leaning forward. This is not a common pose to be in. I mean, Spider-Man can do things no one else can do as far as poses go. And because of that, you end up putting shadows where you normally would think they don't belong. Now that's the end of all the shadows. And at this point, what I'm doing is adding black lines to all the small little spider web creases in the red part of the costume. You could be completely forgiven if you did not want to do this. I would not fault anyone for skipping this step. 
I'm still using my 3-0 brush and just painting very, very fine lines. It's about making sure there's a very minimal amount of ink on the brush. What I'm actually doing here, it's off camera, but after I get a little bit of ink on the brush, I'm actually unloading it by tapping the brush to a paper towel. And that saps out most of the ink and makes sure it's not going to run too freely and puddle up on the model. And what I get then is just the very tip of the brush is unloading paint and giving me very incredibly fine line control. You'll find once you've done this a couple times, you can get fine line control with ink that you just could not get with paint. Now it's worth noting that even these very fine black lines do a lot to make the overall feel of the piece darker. And if you're painting your lines a little bit thicker, either because it's a stylistic choice you've made or just you don't have the practiced hand to get a super fine line, you're going to find the whole model gets a little bit darker and it can become very noticeable that the red part is darker than the blue part because it's kind of crisscross with all these black lines. And if that's the case, what you want to do is just start with your reds being even a little bit brighter than this. And what will happen is the appearance of the black and the appearance of the red will average out. Now one thing you'll note is that the black shadows are very shiny at this moment. Most inks, in fact every ink I've found, but there might be exceptions I don't know of, tend to be quite glossy. And the fix for that is once the whole model is done, just making sure you hit it with a good even spray of a matte varnish. Tester's Dull Coat is great. I use Krylon Ultra Flat. I'm sure there are other really good products out there. But any sort of really flat matte finish will help lock down the ink and also keep it from having that really sort of almost iridescent shine that inks can sometimes have. So I think you can tell from watching this part of this video that the process of inking all these fine lines around the red part of the costume is probably the most time consuming part of this model. If you were to avoid that by either using, you know, maybe a null oil wash on the black or just choosing not to even bother lining it, this model paints up in probably under an hour. And it's really painting all those tiny black lines that really add to, you know, how long this paint job takes. But it's also a very rewarding finish and I think it was well worth the time invested. Now it's worth noting you also could, if you want a little bit of a lighter finish, not use a black ink for those lines specifically, but instead use just a darker red, for example Corn Red from Citadel might work, or Amethyst Rose from P3. You could even dip a little bit into a purple tone if you wanted to. Anything that gets you a little bit darker than the reds you have there but isn't black would also work really well and just keep the whole finish from getting quite so dark. So what I've been doing here now is using a couple extra black shadows to accent Spider-Man's muscle definition. Now there's not a lot of that that needs to be done, but there's some very specific sort of folds in the costume around his waist and also at each knee, and it just helps to add a little bit of a shadow to those. And of course we need to add a black line around the Spider-Man emblem on his back, especially because it's where red meets blue, and we want to have a break between those two colors. And here's those little folds at Spider-Man's waist. There's just a crease in the fabric because he's kind of got this twisting motion going on as he reaches forward. And a little line really kind of lends the idea of motion there. It makes that exaggerated just a little bit more and really brings out the dynamicness of this pose. Dynamicness is a real word, right? So even with all that webbing to work with, the fingers are probably the most challenging part to line well because you don't want to just blot them out with the black ink. You want to make sure you keep them nice and distinct and vibrant. And it can be a little bit hard to do that while also adding black lines to them. Now thankfully, Spider-Man's actually got a bit of a closed fist here. And you really just have to kind of, you know, line around the thumb and kind of in the crease of the fingers. And that's about it as a bare minimum. The other hand is wide open and you really just have to line around the two closed in fingers, the other ones already kind of take care of themselves. 
The last thing to do is just bring some comic style to the base itself. Right now it's big flat areas of color and that's kind of boring. So the base has a lot of cracks in the pavement and I find just accenting those cracks with a black line is a really good way to start. And then because Spider-Man has some integrated rubble, make sure you outline the rubble and pick out some of the more obvious kind of edges and planes in the rubble itself as well. Now that big piece of rebar, I'm going to want to go in and add some deep shadows to it. That's pretty easy to do too, because there's a big chunk of it that just faces downward. And the internal planes, we could add some shadows using just a series of hatch marks. So you can see as I go, I'm basically outlining the major chunks of the rubble. You know, there's a couple different big obvious stones and I'm just working along the really noticeable creases and edges and just adding a little bit of black there. I don't want to overdo it. I don't want it to feel like it's black by the time it's done, but just some small lines here and there, a little bit of, you know, little chipping, a little damage just with some little extra little hits of black ink really goes a long way to making this base look complete and as if it's been kind of sketched in place. Now one thing you'll notice is that the base is really flat color-wise compared to Spider-Man. I've done a lot of work with highlighting on Spider-Man, whereas the base really doesn't have much in the way of highlights. And that was an intentional choice I made. I think if I were to paint this model again, I'd probably add at least a little bit of highlighting to the base. But the idea was that backgrounds in comics are often painted or drawn to a lower detail than the characters that occupy those scenes are. And that's to help isolate you know, what is background versus what is foreground. You put, you know, more attention into your foreground elements. And I kind of was trying to capture that spirit here where the basing is kind of, you know, flat, almost two-tone stuff where the character has that extra level of shading. Like I say, now, if I were probably to redo this, I would probably add a little more shading. It's something that I could actually just go back and revisit, you know, add some highlights pretty quickly to. And I do intend to do that at some point in the future. If you're comparing this to a video I've filmed more recently, like Black Panther, for example, you'll see there's a little bit more attention given to the base. So here I'm adding some small freehand details to the base. I like to think of these as coffee stains. They're basically just small little semi-circular details, and they just break up the openness of some of the bigger surfaces. Now I'm going around and just adding a black line to that sort of raised lip area and filling that in. And the very last thing I'll do is just paint the edge of the base rim with a little bit of blue. I'm using Templar blue from Reaper. I honestly don't have a specific reason why I chose this blue. I just wanted a blue that was on the base that wasn't also part of the character's costume, so it felt a little bit separate. And this blue is a little bit closer in tone to the gray of the base. So it's less punchy, less visually impactful, but still has that idea of you know, my heroes have blue bases, my villains have red bases, and so on. So it kind of gets a point across while well, without being so in your face as a brighter blue might be. And that is Spider-Man from the Marvel Crisis Protocol starter set complete in comic style. I really enjoyed working on this piece, and it certainly helps that Spider-Man is one of my all-time favorite Marvel heroes. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and until next time, do something epic. Hey, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed that one, please hit like and subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell so you get notifications when I post new videos in the future. If you want to take your support even further, you can do that at patreon.com slash epic duck. Every little bit helps keep the lights on and the paint flowing, puts new models on the table so I can make interesting videos, and most importantly, puts a roof over my family's head and food on the table. You can also join me for live painting shows several times a week at twitch.tv slash epic duck studios. I'd love if you came by and watched the show sometime and followed the channel. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who supported my content over the years, both past and present. It's been an absolutely wild ride, and I couldn't do this without all the wonderful fans and flockers out there. The hobby community is just an amazing group of people, and you really make this worth doing. So let's just keep on doing this together, making more content, and just being fantastic together for years to come. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, do something epic.